we'll begin. So first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for organizing this and for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be in BIMSA for the first time in my life, not the first time in the Beijing area. So I'm going to talk about uh, integrable systems and algebraic geometry. There is a slightly different title, but never mind that. So there will be two motivations. One sort of comes very naively. And I don't know whether you can read this in the back. Can you read this on the screens or somewhere? Well, you can read on the screens on the side. OK. Uh, so first is I want to tell you how to solve solving differential equations. This is a very naive uh, viewpoint. Of course, it will become slightly less naive as we go along. So this is well known for linear differential equations. So if I have a differential equation, so u is a function of x, and I can try to solve an equation, you know, u prime plus 2u is equal to 0. We all know how to solve such things. If I write a higher order equation, you know, u, a number of derivatives plus, you know, 5u and something like that, you also know how to solve that. But what if nonlinear? By nonlinear, I don't mean that it's nonlinear in the derivatives, but I just have coefficients of functions. Of x. So what could you do then? In your ordinary differential equations, you probably learned something, but maybe not as much. And this is a very vague question, but presumably quite interesting. And when you ask such a question, you need to ask, what does it mean to solve? Why should you ask this? Because if you're trying to solve something like that, well, you're going to get various exponentials and stuff like that. These are elementary functions. I know very well how to solve for them. But in general, if I write a complicated differential equation, there is no reason to think that this will have a nice solution. So certainly, this is not going to be an elementary function. And if you want to convince yourself of that, just think of the gamma function. It satisfies some differential equation under certain circumstances. But uh, you can think about hypergeometric functions and so on. <laughs> well, I wrote diff dot. And, <laughs> and you can read it any way you want. Uh, this was by accident. I was going to say uh, in two minutes that I'm not going to treat different equations. So let me wait for this two minutes. So, but you should know that when you try to solve, uh, sometimes it could be that the best way to describe a function is to say it is a solution of such and such differential equation. And you may not necessarily hope to get any better view of this function. So here solve would mean that you can get some more information about what this function is, instead of just saying it solves a differential equation, which is to say you may want to construct this function. So of course, hypergeometric functions or gamma functions, which satisfy difference equations, appear in other situations, not just the solutions of differential equations. They appear in nature, in a way. And sometimes you may have systems of differential equations this is all motivational, so I'm not aiming for any precision whatsoever. And this sometimes may be completely integrable, which is to say that even though you maybe don't know how to solve, you may know all the integrals of motion somehow. Okay. And then uh, there is something that this is going to lead us to, and this has to be an algebra geometric, algebra geometric solutions, by which I mean some solutions that come from algebraic geometry that can be constructed from some geometric data. 
you can think about whether this fit in this category that uh, depends on your viewpoint. And the main works I'm going to describe here are the works by Igor Kuchever, and they are basically in the 70s. It's, uh, they, uh, so the foundations for what this is going to be is from the 70s. So that's motivation number one. There is motivation number two, which is about curves. So for me, a curve throughout these lectures will be a complex projective, which is to say algebraic and compact, connected, reduced, you didn't hear these words, which is also the same as a compact Riemann surface. If you have a curve, there is lots of uh, geometric data associated to this. One particular kind of interesting geometric data is a Jacobian of a curve, which I'll denote Jacobian of C. And you can embed a curve inside this Jacobian. So what is a Jacobian? Jacobian is a principally polarized Abelian variety. I'll explain what these are in due course. And the map that takes a curve C and sends it to its Jacobian defines an embedding of the moduli space of curves of genus G to the moduli space of principally polarized Abelian varieties of genus G. These are moduli spaces. And this is a very interesting map for the following reason. Somehow I would view modular curves as a very geometric object, a very complex geometric, algebraic geometric, depending on your viewpoint. But this is a geometric thing. So it's somehow geometry, there are objects on curves with a geometric nature. This is in some sense a more arithmetic object because all abelian varieties are quotients of the complex space. And somehow the data is more of an arithmetic nature. Some lattice or something. So this relates to different kinds of data. And there is a problem. Uh, let's call this map J. Uh, the problem is called the Schottky problem. It's about 150 years old. And this is to describe the image, to find out which abelian varieties are Jacobians of curves, okay? So from now on, when I say curve, I always mean compact, smooth, all of that. Whenever I say abelian variety, I mean principally polarized, just because it's faster for me to speak this way. Nothing else will appear in this lectures until further notice. And here, uh, there is this uh, Schottky problem, which is to describe the image. There is a weaker problem, a weaker version of the problem. So you see, if I have a curve, I can embed this curve in this Jacobian. So given a curve C embedded into an abelian variety, you can ask whether the abelian variety is the Jacobian of a curve. That's a much weaker version because this somehow says if I give you an abelian variety, can you find a curve such that this abelian variety is a Jacobian of this curve? This says, if I give you an abelian variety and somehow magically I also give you a curve sitting inside this abelian variety, a specific curve, not some curve, is the abelian variety the Jacobian of this curve? This is a much weaker question, right? I have given you much more data. You can try to think about this question. It's still highly non-trivial and interesting things do happen. We won't go this way. And what relates these two approaches is somehow the keystone. I don't know whether keystone is the right word here. Is we are going to solve suitable differential equations. Differential equations. Via some functions. I mean the solutions will be given some functions. 
which originate from curves. And the differential equations will be, that will solve these differential equations will solve the Schottky problem. So this is why these two stories are on the same blackboard, because if I solve, well, I'll tell you precisely what the equations are, how we'll solve them, what the functions are. But the idea is somehow starting from a curve, I'll be able to construct some solutions of some differential equation. And the fact that I have been able to do this will characterize curves among all abelian varieties, which means you could try to do similar things starting from an abelian variety, and you will succeed if and only if this abelian variety is a Jacobian. The main result, somehow the most striking celebrated result here, is perhaps a Kritschever's proof about 15 years ago now uh, of uh, uh, Welter's trisecond conjecture, characterizing abelian varieties, uh, uh, Jacobians among abelian varieties by the property of the Kuma variety having trisecons. I will not uh, aim to prove this full. I'll prove a slightly weaker version more or less completely if we're successful. But we're not yet in a position where I can explain what these words mean, and it will take us quite a while to get into that position. Okay? So that's roughly the plan of the lectures. Okay, now, uh, being a good American professor, comes time for disclaimers. So I'm not an expert on integrable systems. Many people in the audience are, and probably know many parts of the theory better than I do. So if I say something completely wrong, please correct me. If I am lying slightly, I will happily admit that I'm lying slightly. I will lie throughout. So I, I will try to avoid as many technicalities as possible. Hopefully, I will not write things which are just false on the blackboard, but I will write things purposefully which will need more work to make them precisely correct. Okay? I also do not know what your background is, so maybe this is a good time to find out. How many of you think of yourselves as primarily experts on integrable systems? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, you can be an expert in more than one thing. How many of you think of yourselves as algebraic geometers? How many of you think of yourselves as complex geometers? Differential geometers? Representation theory? Um, algebra more broadly? <laughs> Mathematical physics? Okay. Uh, I'll keep asking this because I, I would like to know at which speed I should go and what I should cover in more detail. So please ask many questions. This would be wonderful. Also, if I'm going too slowly, just yawn very loudly and I'll get an idea that I should speed up. But basically, we'll see how fast it goes. There is something I do want to cover, but on the other hand, I, we can cover less or more depending on how it goes. Any questions on the motivation so far? Okay, now we'll be much more precise. So I want to talk today about commuting differential operators. Okay, so a uh, last check. Is this large enough, people in the back? Yeah, I mean, I, I know there is a screen, so using the screen is good. Okay, am I loud enough? Okay, good. So... L will be a general differential operator in one variable x. And I'll be a little sloppy as to whether x is a real number or a complex number. Let's say complex, but shouldn't make much of a difference. So what do I mean by this? So L you're going to write, it's an order n differential operator, it's going to be a finite sum from zero to n of some coefficients that I'm going to denote ui of x, di, dxi. So it's a sum of the first n derivatives of the function you're trying to apply it to with some coefficients. So this is a general differential operator in one variable. Okay. 
So I think we're supposed to have exercises. And there'll be a first exercise in a second. I'm being extremely sloppy. So you are some functions. Uh, holomorphic, meromorphic, uh, smooth, we'll see. Uh, I, will, I will try to leave this unsaid. And we'll see whatever category of functions you can see the here will be the category of functions you have to consider further on. But this is some kind of functions on C. Okay. Sorry, I mean, I do want it un unclear. So exercise, uh, yeah, sorry. We want uh, to determine eigenfunctions. So solving an equation is, of course, to say that L kills some function. And uh, eigenfunction just means that the eigenfunction, so I want to solve an equation L times some psi, where psi is a function of x, is equal to constant times, sorry, constant is probably a complex constant in this setup uh, of x. So psi is a function of x, okay? So I'd like to find all eigenfunctions for all possible eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are this constant. So we need to decide how we're going to think of this constant. So if you're a physicist, you probably want to call this constant E for energy, and that's fine. On the other hand, uh, you can try to say that somehow a nicer way to think of this will be the nth power of some constant, k to the n. You're motivated by exponentials, as you'll see in a second. So my eigenvalue, I'll write either e for it or k to the n, where e and k are complex numbers in principle. And I want to solve formally for a formal solution. Okay, uh, I'll tell you in a second what I mean by this. But let me first state an exercise. Uh, I don't know whether this color is different. Exercise, yes, it's different show that by basically change of variables that it is enough to consider, and this is vague, so I don't want to tell you what enough means, to consider uh, differential equations where the top coefficient is just one, so it's just the nth order derivative, and then there is no next order coefficient, and then I have all the lower orders, okay? By enough, I mean you can do changes of variables and of various kinds, and you know, you can shift x and do other things. So somehow the message of this is to say that the interest in, that it's convenient to just look at equations of this form. So we have the highest order just with no coefficient, then there is no next term. This also somehow matches with the fact that I take k to the n, because if I try to plug in e to the kn as my psi, you know, this is going to be the eigenfunction and there are going to be low order corrections. And here is a theorem. Uh, many of the theorems, I mean, all the theorems that I am stating today appear in the words of Kuchever. Some of them are not due to him. This is a theorem that I'll prove in a second. For any x naught, I guess in C in my setup, there exists a unique formal solution psi of the equation L psi is equal to k to the n psi of the form psi of x is equal to the sum for s going from zero to infinity of some coefficient psi s, which is a function of x, k to the minus s, e to the k, x minus x naught, which is normalized at a point x naught, such that the lowest order term psi naught of x is identically equal to, zero, to one, and such that for any s, the value of x naught, the value of s at x naught is zero. Okay. 
So when I say a formal solution, I just mean I take this power series, I plug it into this equation, and it just works. I'm not worrying about convergence in any shape or form. Okay? So this would be called a solution that's normalized at x0. Notice, of course, this condition does not depend on x0. This is just to say that I want to take at lowest order, I'm just taking e to the k times x minus x0. And then I want no corrections at higher orders at the point x0. Okay, let's prove this. Maybe before I do this, is the statement clear? This is, a, this is a purely formal statement that says, if I give you any a differential operator L, which is to say if I give you a bunch of these UIs, and of course I will from now on always pretend that they are this form, that I can find unique functions Xi S, this is my badly written S, right? such as this series in k inverse, right? This is a series in k inverse, well, times exponentials, but never mind that. Solve the equation. Well, the proof is very simple, so it's just a computation. So what are we looking for? So I want my psi to be equal to the e to the k times x minus x naught, right? And I want the first order term to be one, then I want psi one of x, k inverse plus psi 2 of x, k minus 2, right? That's what my, I want my psi to look like. And I want all of those guys to vanish identically at x naught. And I just differentiate. So I'm going to compute more or less for you the derivative of this, the i's derivative. And let me just compute the i's derivative of this term. So x, sorry. So I'm going to get k to the minus s if I differentiate many times here. Uh, sorry, there is, I'm forgetting the exponential, which of course is here. So notice what, what's going to happen. If I differentiate the exponential, it's not going anywhere, right? It's going to stay. If I differentiate the exponential with respect to x, I'm going to get a, a factor of k, which is going to cancel one of the k's from here. If I differentiate here, the powers of k go, whatever, down. Uh, uh, sorry, if I differentiate with respect to k, which we're not doing yet, but we'll do in a second, the powers would go down. But this is a constant, it doesn't play any role. I'm differentiating with respect to x. So I get k to the minus s times, well, d xi s di dx to the i, e to the, k, I mean, e to the k x minus x naught. That's one thing I could do. Or I can differentiate one time less, di minus 1. And then I get times k for differentiating the exponential plus, and so on. Uh, for me, all the combinatorial factors are 1. So if you keep going, maybe there are some factorials, but let's not worry about it. So what this, what is to, what this is to say is that if I differentiate this term, I'm going to get k to the minus s times uh, you know, something that doesn't involve k plus something times k plus a polynomial in k of degree, whatever it is, s, s minus 1, i, i, I guess. Okay, so that's what I'm going to get. So now if I take the derivative of psi, I will take such a derivative in each term. So I apply i's derivative to here. I'm going to get a term in the lowest order plus the next highest order plus so on. Right? So all you can do is you can just, so you solve, you simply solve. So it, uh, so at each order, at, at each exponent of, at each order k to the minus s, you solve 
was the next psi s, right? So the psi s will start contributing from the order minus s and higher orders. And the first time it shows up, it will cancel, start canceling some of the things we have before. So you can just solve for it. Of course, to solve for it, you need to solve a differential equation which says some derivative of psi is equal to what is given. And I'm not going to do this explicitly, but this is going to work, right? You can always integrate. That's it. And notice that somehow, if you were to write this, this would be some kind of diagonal, well, uh, triangular matrix of equations, and each psi will show up in exactly one term first, so you solve for that. As the next order, you'll have one more derivative, but then you'll go to the uh, psi x s plus one. So this will keep going. So uh, exercise is to do this. Exercise, which I encourage you to do this, is to do this completely correctly by yourself. So somehow, as you may notice, this is completely elementary, right? I haven't done any higher mathematics whatsoever. And much of my course will remain completely elementary. And I know from experience that if somebody says, oh, this is elementary, many people, especially advanced PhD students, just put down their pens and think, oh, it's elementary, it's not interesting. So many years ago, I went to a course on analytic number theory uh, taught by Peter Sarnak. And I don't remember what the result was, but this was in Princeton, and there are many very advanced PhD students. And Peter said, oh, and now let me tell you something elementary. And you could just hear all the students pushing down their pens because elementary are not going to take notes. And then Peter Sarnak looked around the room and said, no, 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 I didn't say trivial. I said elementary, which means there is a very nice idea there, which doesn't require any presupposition. So I think there are many nice ideas, many due to Igu Fisher and what happens here, but they are elementary. So I do want to ask you to do this. Just convince yourself that this is just a computation. There is nothing mysterious. If I do it on the blackboard, I'm sure I'll mess up. But, uh, if you do it on a piece of paper, you will probably succeed. Okay, so that was my end of the proof. So raise your hand if this is believable. Okay, raise your hand if you're planning to do the exercise and do it correctly. Uh, the answer to that question was mandatory yes. Okay, corollary. I mean, this is not quite a corollary. You need some more work. But, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't <laughs> specify the time. Yes. So you may, if you have already done this in the past and remember how it worked, then you're fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will denote this solution. I will need to denote this. So denote. So I get this solution. I'm going to denote this as psi, which is, of course, a function of x. And I'd like to keep k as somehow an argument of this function because it's a series on k. It depends on k. It depends on the eigenvalue. And, of course, it's normalized. So let me put x naught here as the point where I've normalized. So this is my notation for this solution. And notice uh, something interesting happened here. Elementary, but very interesting. Before, I was saying this is a function psi of x, right, which is an eigenfunction of L for the value k. Somehow a leap of faith here is I'm now considering phi, uh, psi sorry, as a function of x and k. Yeah, it's a formal function, it's a formal power series, I'm not worrying about any kind of convergence. But notice what is being said here is I didn't say anything about what k is, right? So this was the true statement for any k, and I have found a solution for any k. And this solution, you see exactly how it depends on k. I'm not going to get into the discussion of whether you can sum such formal series. That's not the point. But the point is that this has a very explicit dependence on k, which is essential. So somehow, instead of just solving for one eigenfunction, I have solved for all eigenfunctions at once for all k. And what is interesting is that I can see specifically and very explicitly the dependence of all this on k. So notice what is happening here. Instead, if you're doing you know, linear algebra in a finite dimensional space, you have a finite number of eigenvectors, right? For each one, you have, an, uh, right, you have a finite number of eigenvalues. For each one, you have some eigenspace of solutions, which is finite dimensional. So you have, you know, your five eigenvectors, whatever. Here, the eigenvalues 
can deform arbitrarily, and the solutions will deform nicely if I deform the eigenvalue. This is crucial to the whole story. No, sure, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, I mean, uh, the um, ASIC, yes, I, yeah, okay. So you want to basically, you start with uh, the exponential, and then all the corrections should not touch your value at x0, okay? And uh, what you can prove here is the following, is any formal solution of my equation for the, eigen for the eigenvectors has the form psi of x k is equal to this chosen solution times some function which only depends on k and x naught. Okay. So I found one solution, that was a normalized at x naught solution. I claim that I have found all eigenfunctions, essentially, that everything else, I know how it works. I just take this guy and I multiply it by something which is independent of x, right? This is independent of x, but it depends on k and x naught. We can discuss how it depends on k and x naught. I'm not going to go into that, I mean, but you can see this. Uh, how do you prove this? Well, you need to prove uniqueness, right? You need to uh, obviously, what I have written here on the right is going to solve this equation because L is a differential operator in X. From the point of view of X, this is just a constant. Nothing happened. Okay? But you need to check that there are no other solutions. This is trivial, and this is your exercise. Prove this. Okay? Again, this is an elementary exercise, but I highly encourage you to do this just to see that things just work very naively. I don't, I don't know naively, but very directly. So this sort of completes the study of eigenfunctions, formal eigenfunctions of one differential operator. What I'd like to do now is to consider more than one differential operator. So I have my L, which was L1, which had this form that I was writing on the blackboard for you. But I could also consider another differential operator of the same form. Uh, yes. No. Uh, whenever I make a mistake today, I'll blame that lag. It will get harder as we go along. But yes, thank you. Uh, this certainly had coefficients. And okay. And I can have another differential equation of a different order, a differential operator but of the same form. Okay. I know the eigenfunctions of this one, the formal eigenfunctions. I can do the same analysis for the eigenfunctions of this one, right? Doesn't matter. Uh, there is some technicality here that uh, for me, technicality, uh, which I'll try to avoid mentioning, but whenever I do this, I'm going to assume an M co-prime. And the main example will be N equal to two, M equal to three. I will, some of the things I write will implicitly assume this, but I won't do that, that's technical. So I have two such equations. I can find all the eigenfunctions of this guy. I can find all the eigenfunctions of this guy. If you think about finite dimensional linear algebra, if I have two linear operators, 
when do they have a common eigenfunction? So if I have two matrices, yeah, so now we have to be careful. Do I want them to have one common eigenfunction or do I want them to have all eigenfunctions in common, right? And this becomes even more interesting in my infinite dimensional spaces. So I'd like that for them to have all eigenfunctions in common, which is to say that they would commute. So the commutator is, of course, so somehow the moral question is, when is the commutator L1, L2 equal to zero, okay? So exercise, is to write down what this means explicitly. Write down this explicitly for n equal two, m equals three. So just do a computation, commute to differential operators. Don't be afraid, you'll compute some derivatives of v, you'll compute some derivatives of u, you'll get something. This is some condition. If you look at this, you can first of all ask yourself what's the order of the differential operator and then all the coefficients better vanish. So this, even though it looks like one equation that I wrote here, this is more than one equation. And if L1 and L2 were of very high order, these are many, many equations relating U and V somehow, right? And I'm asking you to really compute this. In the simplest case, N equal to M is equal to three, which is actually good enough for most of our purposes. Okay, next theorem. So, uh, given L1 and the corresponding solutions, psi uh, normalized solutions, x, k, x naught, then for L2 of the form as above, L1, L2, L1, L2, the commutator is zero, if and only if, if I take L2 and apply it to my solution, normalized as normalized, and then I divide by psi, is a function which I'll denote A of K. So the key point here is that this is independent of x naught, okay? Proof. This is again an elementary computation. Uh, before I do this, I'm being very sloppy where we work. These are all formal solutions. Until further notice, until we start doing geometric construction of solutions, psi are just formal expansions of this sort, right? And they all start with one, so I can reasonably invert them. That's not an issue, right? And this is only formal. I can compute these things. They will not converge, but I never worry about convergence. But I can compute term by term exactly what this means, right? And in principle, this is going to depend on x naught. First of all, let's convince ourselves it does not depend on x, right? Because somehow I wrote some function of x, k, and x naught, and why does this not depend on x? Well, it doesn't depend on x because of this, right? I don't know here. So proof, I don't know, one of the two directions. If uh, L1, L2 is zero, then of course L2 psi x, k, x naught, is also a k to the n eigenfunction of L1, right? Just because, you know, L1, L2, psi, x, k, x naught is, if they commute, the same as L2, L1, uh, x, k, x naught, which is L2 times k to the n, psi x k x naught, right? This is a, this is a, 
the usual thing. I mean, this is why in finite dimensional linear algebra, commutation is the same as having a common basis of eigenfunctions. That's trivial, right? But this means, so by corollary that I'm going to use, even though of course I haven't proven this, but that's straightforward and that's your exercise. This means that my L2 psi xk x naught must be equal to psi x k x naught times something which is called a of k and x naught, right? So that's automatic. So I know that if L, if the commutator, I'm proving this direction, right? If the commutator is zero, then I know that L2 psi is an eigenfunction of L1. So it's this times something which is independent of x. So my goal now is to show that it's also independent of x naught, right? And I'll write something and then I'll hope that you just believe me. Uh, Okay. I want to be sure I write correct formulas, which means I don't. So I want to check that this A of K and X naught is really independent of X naught. So I just like to compare A of K X naught to A of K and some other thing, uh, some other value. So any, for any X naught prime, I can also of course compute the delta two psi X K x naught prime is equal to psi x k x naught prime times a k x naught prime. And then what I want, I want to know that this is the same as for x naught. Okay? And for this I just do a computation and think about what this means. The ratio of what? L2 psi over psi. Why? Well, because psi is a different than x naught, and x naught prime is different by a constant factor, which is independent of x. Yeah, but which differs on x naught and I mean, So if I take, I mean, there'll be a ratio of these two things, yes. So if you change x naught, the psi is multiplied uh, over all scale. Yes. Yes, I mean, okay. So, um, yes, I, I want to write something uh, which is equivalent to what you're saying. I want to write something else. Yes. I was uh, very sloppy always. Uh, so, I hope that A, in all of this, I hope that A has this, I mean, A is well going to be a formal function always. I mean, I cannot hope for any better. A is not going to depend on roots of uh, K. It's going to depend on A, on K itself, right? That's why I'm using K and not E, which is the nth power of. And this is going to be a formal function which I can expand in a similar form. I'm being... Uh, at the moment I'm talking about formal solutions. What I'm doing now is completely formal. There is no curve, there is no convergence, there is no actual function. It's just a formal sums of, you know, it's an exponential times some formal series. There is nothing like that, but yes. So of course what Pasha said was completely right, but uh, I want to somehow say that there, there is an easy way to see this. So if I take psi of x uh, k x naught and then take e to the k x naught prime minus x naught, right? This, I mean, is just a constant multiple of that guy, right? But how did I change it? Well, 
I mean, this was, uh, the psi was basically e to the k uh, x, now I have to suffer because maybe it's this way, okay, plus psi one, uh, psi one of x, e to the k x minus x naught plus, plus dot dot dot, right, times e to the m, to the k, times k to the minus one, okay? So if I just recompute this, I mean the exponent just got changed, right? So nothing much happened. Right? So this is also an eigenfunction of psi but now it's normalized at x naught prime. True? What was the normalization? The normalization was that this guy was supposed to vanish at x naught. It still vanishes at x naught, I didn't change that, right? So this is not the normalized, so this is not equal to this in general, right? But it's still a solution. And this means that this guy must be equal to my original function times some b, say of k, x naught prime, x naught. Depends on x naught prime, okay? But this dependence is very easy and I know how it works, so you can Compute, compute then that this implies what Pasha was saying also. But I, what I wanted to do, I, I wanted to do this computation. Somehow the dependence of the normalized solution on x naught prime on x naught is not so immediately obvious. It's not just you multiply by an exponential. It's a bit more elaborate, okay? So, you know, compare a k x naught prime and you basically multiply L2 by the same. So uh, L2 will multiply the same way if you want to switch. And B, and you're going to get that A of K. As you probably have figured out by now, if I'm being so sloppy, this means it's your exercise. So. We could say it many ways, but every point x0 defines the normalization. Passing from one normalization to another is some procedure. And then the normalization for L2 psi will change the same way. This is what this says. Okay. This is exactly what this says. So you are going to compare here psi xk at x naught, the same at x naught prime, and the values of this. And this you are going to change in a trivial way. So this b, if I put L2 here, is going to be the same. But this means that this rescaling is just the same. So it all cancels, okay? Make sense? But please complete this. Of course, I lost. Okay, so uh, this was one direction. The other direction, I haven't done proving this theorem, I haven't finished proving this theorem, is I need to show that if L2 psi divided by psi is a function of just k, then The commutator is zero, okay? So this is also somehow easy, but elementary in perhaps a different way. So what do I mean by that? So how do we prove this? 
So I know something about eigenfunctions, and I want to prove that the commutator is zero. This is a trick, I mean, this is a, an easy mental exercise that we're going to do a couple times. So what is this commutator? This commutator is a differential operator of some order, you know, n plus m minus one or whatever. And I want to know that this is a zero differential operator. If I have a differential operator of finite order, and I fix its eigenvalue, k to the n here, then the space of solutions is going to be finite dimensional, right? Because I can just solve term by term carefully. But I also know how the solutions depend on k. So if I find this uh, differential operator that somehow has an infinite set of solutions, it must be identically zero, right? That's what we're doing. So let's just see what happens. So I want to check that this commutator will uh, kill all of these functions, right? So there's something else I want to say. Sorry, one second. Questions? nothing else. So let's just compute. So this of course means that L1, L2 psi phi k x naught is going to equal to L1 applied to A of k, which is a constant, L2 psi x k x naught, right? Which of course is the same as to say this is A of k, which is a constant. Depend, does not depend on x naught times k to the k to the n psi x k x naught, right? And this is too, true for any x naught. So. L1, L2 has an infinite dimensional kernel I'll just do this for all x naught so L1, L2 is identically equal to zero Yes, but uh, since I know how they are normalized. I mean, you don't, you need to vary k. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. For any k and x not, okay. sorry. No, no, sorry. And, and also, formally speaking, you need to say something because you cannot specialize k because this term is a word. Yeah. I don't think I need to say that because uh, uh, the solution is formal, but there is still a finite dimensional space of formal solutions, so I don't care. I don't think there is any difference here. So the, the solutions depend on k, and there will be an infinite dimensional space of them because for different k's I get different solutions, but that's all. You cannot specialize k one k. You didn't hear that. <laughs> no, I mean... We can talk. Okay. I'll pretend that I've proven this because I'm not bothering with. I'm not saying 
Uh, I know, but I, I don't, I want to pretend it's okay. Okay. So what does this tell us? This tells us that uh, somehow, given a fixed differential operator L1, I can find out if some other differential operator commutes with it by checking how L2 acts on the eigen spaces of, uh, of L1, right? That's what this says. Now you can ask, what if I have L1, L2 equal to zero, but also L1 and some L3 are equal to zero, okay? So this means that both L1 and L2 must satisfy the condition that is written here. But then I claim corollary, and this is true, then also L2 and L3 is equal to zero, okay? This is now very easy because what does this mean? So this means that for any psi x k x naught, this is a solution eigen eigen function for x one for l l one. I know that l two psi is equal to some a, a2 maybe, of k. And I know that L3 psi, no, psi x k x naught, is equal to some a3 k. Okay, but this of course implies, if I just look at this, that L2, L3, psi, xk, x naught is equal to zero, right? Because I'm just saying that this psi is now a common eigenfunction of both L2 and L3. So of course it's going to be killed by the commutator of L2 and L3. And then by the same argument as here, which I'm still ignoring the formality of, so this means I mean, L2, L3 has infinite kernel for all so the commutator is zero. Let's try and to appreciate what happened here. What happens is the following statement. I start with a differential operator L1, or the formal differential operator L1 of the form as we always describe. And what this says is that if I consider all differential operators of the same form that commute with L1, they will also commute with each other. So this means from L1, I'm going to get a commutative, what is it going to be? Ring algebra, algebra of differential operators, right? Commuting with L1. Of course, I know some elements of that which are boring. So the boring elements is I can just choose L2 to be a power of L1. That, of course, is going to commute with L1. If L1 itself were a square of some L, then of course L square and L cube will also commute, right? So these are some boring elements of this algebra, which is why this condition that I want that it's most interesting to deal with a situation where this orders of the two operators are co-prime should really be here, because then I'm not getting the, into this issue with powers of differential operators. But in any case, getting from L1, I can always consider the set of all differential operators that would commute will, with L1, they will commute with each other, so they give me a commutative structure on this 
differential operators. And you can ask, can you classify such things? And this is where we're eventually going, but not yet. So here is the next theorem. And this goes to Birch now, Chomsky in 1922 or something. It says the following. If a commutator like this is zero, then there exists a polynomial Q of alpha and beta such that if I take this polynomial and plug in L1 and L2, I get zero, okay? This is to say if I have a pair of commuting differential operators of the kind above, then they must satisfy a polynomial equation, okay? What I was just mumbling, of course, if, you know, if L2 is an L1 squared, I know what the differential equation is going to be, right? It's going to be alpha is beta squared or something like that. Or alpha cube is going to be beta cube. This is not very exciting. More exciting are the, the polynomial equations, which are not of this form, right? And the statement is that this is a general story. What I'm not going to tell you is, of course, well, if I have L1 commuting with L2, and I also have L1 commuting with L3, L1 and L3 will also satisfy a polynomial equation. And L2 and L3 will also satisfy a polynomial equation. And you can ask how these polynomial equations relate. And I'm not going to go there because I don't need to, but you should think about this. So let me try to give a proof of this. So let L of E be the vector space of eigenfunctions. L psi is equal to E psi. Then, of course, L2 preserves this vector space, right? L2 maps L of E to itself. Thank you. So L1, okay? So I choose the, uh, my setup has always been the same. I was somehow using L1 as the first operator I choose. I'm taken its eigenfunctions, and I see how L2, L3, whatever, acts on them. So that's the same setup. So I consider the L1 eigenfunctions with eigenvalue E. Since L2 commutes with L1, it will map such an eigenfunction to itself. This is a finite dimensional space. What kind of functions? Great. So this is the functions I mean as always as formal solutions, right? It's some space of formal solutions. I have, so far nobody has asked me again whether my coefficients u are smooth, holomorphic, meromorphic, so I will continue to ignore that. But the space psi, or the space L, is a space of all formal solutions. In fact, I, I asked this question. Well. This is not important. So whatever category you choose, you work in this category, this will still work. That's unimportant, yes. Did I suitably not answer your question? Yeah. Or should I do better? Okay. Sure. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, this is n-dimensional in my setup, yes. So this is a map of a finite dimensional vector space to a vector, I mean, it's a linear map. So it has a characteristic polynomial, Q of alpha comma E of X, uh, sorry, let me write this way, Q E of X, uh, x, I cannot use x because x is my variable and it has nothing to do with this. B is a characteristic polynomial of this operator. It's a finite dimensional operator that has a characteristic polynomial of size m. 
So I can just take that. Claim this polynomial as a polynomial is going to depend polynomially on E. Okay? So a priori here for each E I have a separate characteristic polynomial. So it's a polynomial in alpha with coefficients being some functions of E. But I claim that these coefficients of these polynomials themselves are polynomials of E. You can sort of convince yourself that uh, there is some symmetry here. I start with L1, I can choose L2, right? And that will ensure that I can view this polynomial the other way around, okay? Because what are the roots of this polynomial? The roots of this polynomial are the eigenvalues of L2 on the space LE, but I, I could run the same procedure backwards. I could first choose the eigenspaces for alpha of L2, and then L1 will act on each of such eigenspaces. I can take that characteristic polynomial. But that will depend polynomially on you know, alpha and on E and somehow on alpha. But that's the same polynomial because this polynomial still tells you when you have a common eigenfunction. That's one way to see that. The other way is you can just write down what this really means. Because this is all completely explicit. I can just start solving term by term and I'll see what the, co what the coefficients of Q will depend polynomially, the formulas would be ugly, on E. So you can do that. So this means I can think of Q as just a polynomial in two variables, alpha, beta, okay? But then again, as usual, if I take Q, L1, L2, this is zero for any E, right? But this is, the say, this is a finite polynomial. It's a finite order differential operator, which is zero for all eigenspaces. So this means it has finite kernel so this, may, this has infinite dimensional kernel, so it means it must be identical to zero. Okay. Oh, please, thank you. For me or for the audience? Mm -hmm. This, of course, is completely correct and more conceptual. Okay. Uh, so, this, of course, uh, tells you more, but uh, there is a reason I'm trying to do explicit computations. And uh, eventually, we're trying to do uh, Christian proof of characterization of Jacobians by flexes. And somehow, there are explicit computations there. And you just compute things, right? And uh, much as I'd love to tell you a more conceptual proof of that, I won't be able to. There is a more conceptual, in some sense, algebra geometric proof, but we 
won't be able to develop the machinery for that. So I'll try to tell you eventually Kritschever's original proof, which is somehow elementary again with many ideas. Okay, questions? So uh, you want to compute the dimension of L2, uh, which commute with L1. And then uh, of, order, of order, order, I mean, L2 will be, will start like that and will go to lower orders, right? Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Which, It's a constant, isn't it? Okay. Uh, so this. Uh, so let me let me re, let me refer, I mean, read what Pasha says. So you first check that if you have L one, which is given by the coefficient one in order m, then any L two that commutes with it must have leads in order term a constant times uh, the m derivative. No function here, right? This is something I was very sloppy about purposefully, because I was writing L1, I can always change variables so that it starts with a constant term. If I have L1 and L2, I can do this to L1. Why would I know that I can do this to L2 simultaneously, right? This was something that I was hoping that I would sweep under the rug, which I didn't succeed. Then once you do that, you can check the dimension of space of L2, which commute with L1, is at most m or m plus 1, depending on what you do with the coefficient here, okay? m plus 1 includes in this coefficient, right? So if I set this to be 1, it's m. And that's uh, just, you, you see that you can uh, uh, eliminate many terms by equation. Then you'll uh, try to see how the polynomial ring in two variables grows, and then you'll convince yourself that you have a polynomial relation between L1 and L2. For all this m dimensional space, all of them will satisfy uh, a polynomial equation, which will allow you to answer my mumbling about, you know, if I have L1 and L2, they satisfy some equation. Uh, if L1 and commutes with L2, they satisfy a polynomial equation. If L1 and L3 commute, then they satisfy another polynomial equation. You can ask whether it's the same polynomial equation. And this will go towards answering this question, but I was hoping to keep this for the future. Okay? Any questions so far? Yes. Why do I want uh, n's powers here? Why do I, well, I want to have higher order differential operators, right? Because somehow I was saying, if I had a first order differential operator, if you believe what I said, it's just differentiation with no coefficients, because I can scale out the top coefficient. So I certainly want differential equations of order at least two. Uh, the reason my normalization, if you wish, is such that the eigenvalue is k to the n and not e, because I'm somehow modeling myself on the exponential. So that's if I differentiate this exponential n times, e to the kx n times, I get k to the m. And my solutions are deformations in some sense of the exponential. Okay? Other questions? Okay, so I have a question. How many of you have known all this before? Well, Pasha, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, for, uh, raise your hand if this was too slow. Raise your hand if this was too fast. I can close my eyes and somebody else will count. Okay. Uh, there will be exercises, okay? And uh, this was, notice this was purely formal, right? All I did was commute different finite order differential operators, write solutions as some kind of series, right? And ignore questions in what formality this happens. There is no geometry so far the only geometry you're going to see here is you get this polynomial Q, right? It's a polynomial in two variables. So the polynomial Q of alpha beta being zero gives me a curve in C2. This is an algebraic curve, which can be arbitrarily singular in principle. I never said anything about its singularities, and it will be, in, in fact, generically, it will be singular. Of course, uh, 
being an algebraic geometer, which I am, I don't like curves on C2. I'd like to further compactify them to P2 or P1 cross P1, which I can do. The singularities I will mostly ignore for this talks, even though they're a major issue that one needs to deal with with many things. But this is the first time that you see that some, from some purely, purely formal construction, you are suddenly getting an algebraic equation. You're getting a polynomial. Okay? I want to be, Pasha, I want to build suspense. I mean, there is a reason for that. Sorry, yes. Yes, but I'm, I'm trying to somehow push a different view. I mean, yes, but I don't want to think about that yet. So I want to, the message I want to say, this was a purely formal construction with uh, differential operators, okay? And now I want to switch to the other side of the story, to curves. Eventually, these two stories will come together, but for the time being, view them as completely disjoint, okay? Too complicated. Yes, I should, but I'm not pushing this any further for now. Okay? I want to take a step back, and for the next couple hours, I will not write differential differential operators on the blackboard. That's not the plan. Okay. So now I want to take uh, tell you about curves and their Jacobians. Yeah, but if you want to learn the material properly, don't learn it from me. Read the surveys, do things correctly. So uh, there are some omissions here. There are some things that can be done differently. Everything can be done differently, maybe better. But I'm trying to push towards some particular viewpoint that will eventually lead us to try sequence flexors and all that stuff. And I'm trying to minimize things we see because it will run out of time as it is at some point. So curves. So C is going to be a complex, compact, genus G, algebraic curve, okay? And I'd like to define for you the Jacobian of the curve C, okay? How many of you know a definition of, a, of the Jacobian of a curve? Raise your hand. How many of you know two different definitions of a Jacobian, which of course are equivalent, okay? So I want to uh, do this uh, in different ways. So first, I want to say that if you look at the fundamental group of C, is it has generators. I mean, you can choose generators, which I'll write A1, AG, B1, BG, such that Phi one of C is generated by these things subject to just one relation. It's the product for I goes from one to G of the commutators AI BI is one, okay? I expect that uh, almost all of you, if not all of you have seen this, this is an exercise for you, which is not an exercise for the exercise sessions is to convince yourself of this. So if that's the case, and of course, if I take the homology of the curve C with integral coefficient, this is just the fundamental group quotient by the commutate of the fundamental group. And this is just uh, Z to the 2G, which is generated by A1, AG, B1, BG. I'm being sloppy. For me, these are both curves, actual curves, generators of a fundamental group. They're also generators of homology. I'll be purposefully sloppy with that. I 
I have a symplectic pairing, pairing on H1, which I can define by saying that AI doesn't pair with AJ, BIs don't pair, Oops. but if I pair AI and BJ, then this is delta IJ. And I want it to be symplectic, so anti-symmetric. And an exercise is to think about in all possible ways to understand this. So think about this via Poincaré duality. Think about it via Hodge theory. And in any other way you can think about this, okay? So here is a definition. This is an analytic Jacobian. This is to say the Jacobian of a curve C, you take a vector space of holomorphic one forms on C and you quotient by the dual of the integral homology lattice, okay? What does this really mean? This means explicitly the following. So this is an equivalent description of this. So this is an explicit description. So let, so given A1, AG, B1, BG, there exists a unique basis, omega1, omega G, of the space of holomorphic one forms on C, such that the integral of omega I over AJ is equal to delta ij, okay? So I have chosen a basis for cycles, so the a's don't intersect, and I claim that there exists a unique basis of holomorphic one forms, this uh, g-dimensional complex vector space, such that the integrals are just one. Then the period matrix tau of C is the following matrix, is the matrix given by the integrals of this one forms over the B cycles, which are just some complex numbers. Uh, Riemann's bilinear relations are the following statement. It says that if I take this matrix, this is a G by G complex matrix, and I take its transpose, I get itself. So this is to say it's a symmetric matrix. And it also says that if I take the imaginary part of tau, so this is a matrix, a G by G real matrix, symmetric. And the statement is that this is positive definite. Okay? If you have never seen this, try to learn about this. This is not an exercise that you can do on the spot if you've never seen this. Okay? So that's a matrix. 
notation, maybe, which I may or may not use, but we'll see. So HG is a so-called Ziegel upper half space. So this is a subset of matrices of size G by G with complex coefficients satisfying these conditions. If I think about it this way, what's the Jacobian of C? Well, the Jacobian is the space of holomorphic one forms, which is C to the G, spanned by all the omega, quotient by what? The integrals of forms over a basis of cycles, which is going to be Z to the G. This is the integrals over the A cycles, which are just normalized to be the basis vectors, plus tau Z to the G. In this subject, it's very common to always get confused whether you multiply on the left or the right, and I will continue this wonderful convention of writing it randomly and saying, if you want to do it correctly, be careful, okay? But basically, what is this? This is a quotient of a g-dimensional complex vector space by a rank 2g integral lattice. Riemann's bilinear relation tell you that if you take this lattice and you tensor it with R over Z, you're going to get everything. This is to say this non-degenerate lattice, okay? Moduli space of curves, MG, this is a moduli space of G of G curves. AG, is the moduli space of such things, of these things, of tau in the Ziegelapa half space. When I say moduli here, this means these are isomorphism classes up to biholomorphism. means the same here, okay? There is something I'm being sloppy about. There is a thing called polarization here, which we'll see in a second. But uh, the point is that somehow the way I define, of course, I have a map from the Ziegel upper half space to the moduli space of abelian varieties. And you can figure out what this map is. And this is actually a quotient by the symplectic group. Let me try to explain in a second what this means. So what's this uh, map? So suppose I have some quotient of this sort, which is isomorphic to some other quotient of this sort. And I'm being very sloppy because I'm concealing the principle of polarization, which we'll see more clearly next time. Then I claim that any isomorphism is actually a linear map, which leads to a linear map of CG to itself, which must map one lattice to another. So this should mean that I can get from one lattice to another by an, a linear transformation with integral coefficients. So this would look to be SL to GZ. The principal polarization will tell me this has to be a, a, a symplectic matrix. I don't want to go in this direction, but we'll do something like that next time. So let me say a little bit here though. So definition, a complex torus is a quotient C to the G by some lattice where this is Z to the 2G embedded in C to the G. And that's a non-degenerate lattice, which is what I was saying, that if you tensor with over Z with R, you're going to get everything. 
So a complex torus is what you think a complex torus should be. It's a quotient of the complex vector space by a lattice, okay? And a complex torus is called an abelian variety, a complex torus, whatever. Let's not have notation for it, is an abelian variety if it is a projective variety. If there exists an embedding of it into some CPM, okay? In which case I'm going to think of this as an abelian variety inside CPM, which somehow is isomorphic to a torus, but it's an abelian variety in CPM. What is so nice about CPN? This has a Fubini Studi metric. So if you're a differential geometer, you like the Fubini Studi metric. If you're an algebraic ge geometer, you have the bundle of one. Okay? And you can take this metric, you can restrict it to A. You can take this bundle restricted to A. So this gives a Positive, if you're using the differential geometry language, ample, if you're using the algebraic geometry language, line bundle on A, which we'll call L. So the definition a complex principally polarized abelian variety is a complex principle A is a projective A, I don't have to impose it because I'm going to say with an ample line bundle L such that the dimension of the space of sections of L is 1 and there is a group structure I can add points on A okay so uh, this is an explicit way to see this this is a slightly less explicit way and of course your exercise is this equivalent You need to unravel a little bit what is equivalent. So this is not quite correct. I shouldn't take an ample line bundle. I should really take a Schoen class because an abelian variety, I can translate. It's a torus. I can add a point of it to itself. This will translate the line bundle to a slightly different line bundle. I don't want that. So I really want the C1 of an ample line bundle here. And then this picture that I was advocating above you need to understand what it really means for principal polarization. So principal polarization in this condition, I only have one section of the bundle and not many more, right? So that's the definition of an abelian variety. And in the remaining minus one minute I have, I want to say how this relates to our setup. And the setup is there is a theorem. This is a Torelli theorem. is if I take a curve C and I send it to its Jacobian, which is a principally polarized abelian variety, this is an embedding, okay? okay? This is a nice theorem except it's false. So it is true, but not 
really true. So this is an embedding, or uh, the next sentence you can ignore. This is an embedding of coarse moduli spaces. This is a three to one map of stacks. And it is essential for much of what I'm going to say eventually, but I will conceal this, okay? So what does this say? This says, if I have a curve, I can construct from it, it's Jacobian by this construction. And you get a principally polarized abelian variety. The statement is, if I give you a principally polarized abelian variety, and I promise to you that this is a Jacobian, it's a Jacobian of a unique curve. That is what this really says, okay? That's what I just said is a true statement, okay? This is correct as written here. Um, I was very sloppy when I said isomorphism classes. So this should be isomorphism classes preserving principal polarization, which I didn't carefully write here, okay? So that's an explicit picture. This is not how I want to think of it next time. So next time I'll start by telling you a different viewpoint on Jacobians, more geometric, and I want to talk about Riemann theta singularity theorem and eventually get to the statement about the existence of tri-sequence. This will probably take us all of tomorrow, essentially. Yes, yeah, so here I'm being rather sloppy about where the principal polarization is. So the principal polarization is that pairing, as the matrix is diagonal and with all ones, which is to say it's principal polarization, otherwise I'll have some integers along the whatever, anti-diagonals. So here I should say preserving principal polarization. And by principal polarization, I should really mean the first churn class of an ample line bundle. So oil an ample line bundle up to translations, which is equivalent. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, before I say that's it, how many of you have known all this story about Jacobians? Because I need to adjust space. Okay. How many of you thought this was too fast? The Jacobian part? Don't be shy. Okay, how many of you thought this was too slow? Well, I'm sure there are some people in the audience, maybe slightly older people in the audience who feel, slightly less young people who feel that. Okay, that's it for today, thank you. Let me see, let me see if there are any questions, including uh, questions online. You can ask questions in the Zoom chat. So the Jacobian is principally polarized because of this. So the, the polarization of the Jacobian is given by this intersection on A and B cycles, right? So the A and B cycles, you can just draw them. So if I have a curve of genus two, this is a nice curve of genus two, and if I find some colored chalk, which is here, I can draw for you A and B cycles explicitly, which is really a proof that this is always can be done if you make this a bit more formal. So I can choose this to be my a cycles, this is A1, A2, B2, B1, right? So I have just demonstrated for you a cycles that have these intersections as I claim they do. And then if I look at the matrix of the intersections, so I write A1, A2, B1, B2, A1, A2, B1, B2, the matrix has zeros here, zeros here, and has identity matrix here. I'm being sloppy about my signs, so maybe the opposite doesn't matter. But these are ones here, right? Which is to say it's principal polarization. So in principle, I could have a matrix which would look like that. In integral homology, these are a basis of integral homology. They're not just a basis of complex homology, it's a basis of integral homology. If I were unlucky, I didn't choose a base, I may have some multiples. And this would not be a principal polarization. This would be a polarization of type D1, D2, where this is some integers. So the principal polarization is because I can do this for any Riemann surface. Ah, how can you update? So the question is, from this picture, how do I see an ample line bundle L? So an ample line bundle L, I don't want to see. I want to see its first churn class. So the first churn class is C1 of L, right? This is a class 
in second homology, cohomology maybe, of the Jacobian of C, right? Which is really not just in second homology, but is in, H, in H11, if I look at this carefully. But this is an H11, so this is an, more or less a pairing on first homology. That's your pairing on first homology. And you would like to transfer from this to that. Tomorrow I'll tell you a completely different picture of Jacobians, which has, I mean, the period matrix will not show up. Okay, um, may I interject here? I think Sam made an excellent point that there are exercises and that the exercises uh, should be done. But I also think that it's nice to do exercises together. So we do have uh, exercise sessions and discussion sessions for each of the uh, courses, okay? Um, note uh, the structure. Uh, there are two rooms, this room and a similar room in the library building A7, uh, that is downstairs um, by the steps. And um, we don't want to formally split you that let us from A to M attend the first course exercise session in the first hour and the second exercise session in a different room in the second hour, but try to sort of try to balance, okay? Uh, make sure that half of the people spend one hour here and one hour in the other room and the other way around. So we will have uh, uh, TAs who know how to solve all these exercises and will help you and also have the instructors who might know how to solve all these exercises and would also help you. So take advantage of this. Okay. Um, and I suggest we take a coffee break. And questions like this are best discussed slowly during this discussion exercise. Okay.